Welcome to today's episode of featuring Josh Hoffman. I'm so honored to have you on. Josh is the founder of Izzy uh, in Israel and has a multimedia platform called Future of Jewish, uh, which is very fascinating and one of the major reasons that even prompted me to reach out to you, Josh. I remember, how long ago was it now that I had reached out to you? Maybe last fall at this point? Something like that, yeah. Something like that. So I had, I had received an email from something called Future of Jewish. And to me, that was fascinating in and of itself, right? Because when most people think about Judaism and, and everything Jewish related, everything is so historic and in the past, right? No one really talks about the future regarding our people, our customs, our culture, right? So that was the first thing that made me even click on, on the email. I'm thinking, I need to see what this is. And I had remembered the email had said something about what are the most pressing issues for Jews today and moving forward. And at the time I was starting taking back the narrative, uh, which is a Zionism education initiative for those who don't know. And I knew I had to get in Zion, um, countering anti, anti-Zionism, anti right? That that's one of the cruxes of finding, of, of fighting anti-Semitism. And that's how Josh and I started a professional uh, friendship. And we had gone, we had gone on to a meeting in Israel and it was just fascinating to talk about everything related to the future of Jewish. And when we started the podcast, immediately, immediately I knew I had to have you on um, just to delve into all these fascinating subtopics. So without further ado, I have a multi uh, part question, uh, question for you. Uh, what was your inspiration behind starting the initiative? And if you can tell the audience a little bit more about your own background and who and what in your own Jewish purview are your personal Jewish North Stars? Definitely. So thank you for having me. I'm glad to do this. I love having these kind of conversations. Um, so I, I think my story will basically answer all of all of your multi-part question, which is that I grew up in a reformed Jewish household in the outskirts of Los Angeles, born in 1989, right now I'm 33 years old. And really, you know, for the first, whatever, 10, 12, 13, 14 years of my life, you know, you don't really have a brain, an adult brain at least. So, you know, whatever, you know, it was known that I would have a bar mitzvah, I had a bar mitzvah, I went to Hebrew school, like Sunday school twice a week. Um, you know, you don't ask questions too early in life, but I think around, I would say 14, 15, 16 years old, I started to question what this thing called Judaism is. And I was born and raised into a family and a Jewish community and a synagogue, uh, and even Jewish camps that talked about Judaism by and large as a religion. Um, I mean, we talked about it being a culture and we talked about history and we talked about um, maybe a few other purviews of Judaism, but I would say by, by and large, it was a religion. And so as I got into my late teens and I basically said, listen, I'm not a religious kind of dude. Um, and if, if Judaism is essentially a religion, then I'm, it's not really for me. So I really started to write off Judaism as I got into college. I went to San Diego State University, studied journalism. I was really heavily involved in sports at the time. So I was a sports journalist. I worked for NBC, ESPN, among other places, and, and didn't really have any Jewish friends in college, um, didn't join a Jewish fraternity, didn't do anything Jewish, nothing with Hillel or any other organization. And so at that point, when I graduated San Diego State in 2012, at the age of 22, 23, um, I was as far removed from Judaism as maybe any Jew, um, just totally uninterested in anything having to do with Judaism. Um, but my mother kept telling me about this free trip to Israel called Birthright. And she started when I was 18, because that's the first year of eligibility, all the way through when I graduate from San Diego State at the age of 22 or 23. And she keeps saying, go on this free trip, go on this free trip to Israel. Now, the thing for me that was kind of weird is the first 18 years of my life before that, we never spoke about Israel in the home, not that I remember at least. And even in Hebrew school, I barely remember learning about Israel. Like really, I think 
they said it was the size of New Jersey and like that's basically it. So all of a sudden, you know, you can imagine 18, 18 years, basically nothing to do with Israel. And then all of a sudden your mom keeps telling you about this birthright trip to this free trip to Israel. So I was like, where is this coming from? Like all of a sudden you want to talk about Israel 18 years later. And so I basically kind of held her off, held her off, held her off. And then when I graduated San Diego State, I said, you know what? I'll take a free trip anywhere right now because I was a broke college graduate and anything free I would have taken. It could have been a free trip to North Korea and I probably would have went. Just happened to be to a place called Israel. Got on the plane, January 2013. And halfway through the trip, 10 day trip, uh, called my mom and said, mom, this, this place Israel that you've been telling me to go to for the last five years or so, I love it so much. I'm not getting on the plane back home. And I didn't. Stayed in Israel. A few months later, uh, got my Israeli citizenship. My, so I'm a dual American Israeli citizen. Uh, that was mid-2013. Found an apartment in Tel Aviv. Found my quote-unquote long lost, long lost Israeli family, which I never even knew existed. Like, literally didn't know their names. They didn't know nothing. Um, and from there, really started to build my life specifically in Tel Aviv. But of course, in Israel, traveling around, talking to different Israelis, talking to not just Jewish Israelis, but Arab Israelis and other groups that maybe don't get talked about as much. And I would say from 2013 to 2015, 16, for me, it was really just a period of discovery, right? Discovering a new culture, a new language, Hebrew, uh, a new history, Israeli history, and, you know, Israeli society and Israeli customs and, all, you know, Israeli business. And around 2016, I started to realize that no one was really telling Israel's story in the best way, uh, or at least the way, what I think is the best way. So yeah, there's a few media outlets that, that sort of um, share Israel with the world, if you will. But I, I find that news is, is quite ineffective. Uh, on its own, right? If it's if it's alongside other media products, so to speak, then I think it's fine. But I think on its own, news is quite ineffective in telling you know Israel's narrative, right? You know a thing or two about that. Um, and so I. Of enhancing the world's relationship with Israel through media. Uh, number two, build something that can last. You know. Uh, the, the, both the Jewish and the Zionist world don't need another nonprofit. They just don't. Um, and so, you know, build something that can be self sustainable and can grow using that uh, sort of self sustainability or in the business world, recurring revenues. Um, and then it took me, you know, I, I, it took me a while because I had to, you know, I, I learned about journalism in college and I worked in it, but that's old journalism, new journalism, new storytelling, and new media. Is not something that I learned in college. So I really literally spent like a year or two just studying like BuzzFeed and the New York Times, the transformation that they went through and Vice and uh, National Geographic, all these different sort of new media companies or companies that were able to transition effectively to new media, just to understand like business model and branding and all the things that you need to, to launch a successful company. And so finally in 2020, a few things happened in between them, but finally in 2020, we launched Izzy, which is an Israeli streaming platform featuring unlimited Israeli movies, TV shows, and documentaries for audiences around the world. Right now we have English subtitles, hope to add uh, some additional languages soon. Um, and that was actually just the first product. I mean, Izzy, the plan in 2020, when I basically wrote, wrote the business plan, the plan was start with one product make it strong and then leverage that product, the streaming platform in this case, to add additional products that can supplement and complement the, the streaming platform. So we're actually right now in the process of launching additional uh, business units, as they call it in, in, in the startup world. And, um, and so, you know, that's basically that. Now, when I launched Izzy in 2020, um, I didn't realize this at the time, but somebody told me that, you know, I'm now a professional Jew which again, like, what the hell is a professional Jew? Like, okay. And then in two, at the end of 2021, I read a book, a great book, a new book called Why Do Jewish by Zach Bodner, who's the CEO of the JCC in Palo Alto, California. And basically his premise is that being Jewish is, is not really enough. 
uh, that you have to do Jewish, that Jewish is not an adjective, it's a verb. Now, in this book, he, he outlined Jewish history, I mean, literally going back to Abraham and Sarah times, um, you know, the, the recent history, the old history, uh, Israel, Zionism, and I'll be honest with you, like, I didn't really have, I, I, you know, I, I definitely have good Israeli history right now, but I didn't have good Jewish history uh, prior to reading this book. And then he outlined some of the core issues that he sees in the Jewish world in the book. And I read the book in about 48 hours and I said, holy crap, like there's, you know, I've been living in Israel for the last 10 years. So I'm kind of in the quote unquote Israeli bubble, you know, so I'm not, I, I read obviously Times of Israel or the forward or whatever. I am somewhat in, in the know about certain trends or certain things that are happening in Jewish communities around the world. But, you know, by and large, I'm, I'm in this Israeli bubble. So this book really opened my eyes to two things, the tremendous challenges that are facing the Jewish people across the world. And two, I, I believe maybe it's the sort of Israeli in me now that every challenge brings tremendous opportunity. And so I made it my mission, personal mission, after reading this book, basically from November 2021 to just a few months ago, about, you know, we'll call it spring 2022, to study the Jewish world to speak to people across the world from lay leaders and rabbis and community activists and government officials in Israel and people like yourself, you know, sort of Jewish uh, or Israeli startup. Uh, in, in Hebrew, we call them startupistim, like, you know, startup people, whatever. I don't know how to say it in English. Um, and, you know, people that have been in, in the, the field for decades, people that are just getting started, um, really just talked to so many people, I mean, literally hundreds of people, um, because I wanted to understand for myself what the hell is going on. Mm -hmm. um, and the good thing, too, is that there's a ton, a ton, a ton, a ton of content and data and studies and research on the Internet about the Jewish people um, going back to the early 2000s. So and articles and op eds and podcasts and videos. So there's so much to be studied. And then I decided, OK, I, I want to document this, right, because I think it's kind of cool, this, this sort of journey, this research journey that I'm going on. And so you mentioned the multimedia platform. We ended up launching something called Future of Jewish, um, which started out as my second book. Then it became a Substack publication. So we read a bunch of essays and a few videos about, you know, just different aspects of Judaism. Um, and then we also have a, I, I host a podcast as well called Future of Jewish, which you can get on any podcast store. And that's where we're at right now. You know, we're, we're now thinking about potentially rebranding Izzy uh, because we do feel that sort of the wider Jewish net is more advantageous from a mission standpoint, from a business standpoint, uh, from an ability to super serve uh, our customers and would be customers. And uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much for sharing your story. And it's interesting, right? Because a lot of people assume that those who make Aliyah are Orthodox Jews, right? We don't yeah. hear a lot, at least in America, that a reform, non-practicing, basically Jew, just gets up and moves to Israel. So I, I think that's very encouraging. And something that we did not talk um, off record about, but I would love to bring it up if you don't mind, is that, see, I went to Israel for my bat mitzvah. Um, so I grew up very secular, very secular. Um, my own parents are political refugees from a former Soviet Union country from Belarus. And, you know, they grew up without religion. They came here with a thousand dollars that they pawned all their belongings off in Italy. So when they came here, they didn't have time to find rabbis. And by the time we settled in the suburbs, the rabbi that they found, they found him too liberal. And according to my father, he said, I am not sending you to a liberal rabbi. We literally ran away from this <laughs> in, in the old country. So I had to beg my parents. I feel like a lot of kids try to get out of going to Hebrew school. I begged my parents to go to Hebrew school and they just did not allow. So it was interesting to hear your story, right? And so I wanted, wanted to ask you this, is that despite going to Israel when I was 13, because I was steadily consuming the anti-Israel media from 13 to basically 32. I, I had an anti, I, I, I wasn't like against Israel as, as a country, right? I knew it had a right to exist, 
but I definitely absorbed all the lies. So my question to you is that since Israel was not really talked about in your own household, did you, were, did you succumb to any of that anti-Israel bias before your trip to Israel? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, the answer is no. Um, I was so in the world of sports, mm -hmm. both personally as one of my passions and then pursuing sports journalism as a career. Um, I was never into news. And back then, you know, we're talking 2005 to 2012. I mean, there was YouTube wasn't what, what it is today, obviously. And, you know, there's no Instagram. Basically, Facebook was in its infancy. So, you know, basically what you had is the news websites like a CNN or, I don't know, NBC or any of the other ones. And I never really plugged into those in general, not just in terms of Israel, but in terms of like even American news. For me, I was just super into sports. So yeah, I had, when I came to Israel, it was really- a You just had that open mind and you didn't have any mis, mis, misconceptions, right? Uh, from yeah, I, I had a total blank slate. I had no expectations, um, not like, I mean, I was excited to go on this trip uh, again, mainly because it was a free trip. Um, but yeah, I had no, any perception whatsoever. I, I do have one memory of Israel, sort of the visual of Israel, if you will. Uh, from my childhood, I remember I was probably about 12 years old. It was a Sunday morning. I woke up around 9.30, 10 a.m., walked into my parents' room, and my dad was on the floor stretching because he stretches every morning. And I walk in, I remember, and he's stretching and I look at the TV and there's sort of like a, I don't know if it was a helicopter view or like a, a top building view looking down to the street. And it was a bomb that had exploded on a bus in Tel Aviv, I believe it was. And that was during what I later understood was the second Intifada. Um, that is like the only visual that I really had. And even then, like, I only remembered that after I made Aliyah. So when I went on my birthday trip in 2013, like, I don't even think that was in my head. So for me, yeah, it was, it was quite empty in terms of the canvas. Which is great because that led you on this great journey of yours as well. And so something else that you mentioned, well, first of all, I want to uh, mention to all the viewers to absolutely subscribe to the Future of Jewish because it, it's like getting a Jewish gift every single time you post. Um, and it's great because it's it's philosophical, it's spiritual, uh, it has a little bit of religion in it, a, a lot of history, and it really, I would say, it it, it bends it bends the mind on on a lot of misconceptions, right, that people have about being a Jew, or being Jewish, and even for for non Jewish followers as well. I think it's one of the best examples of learning, you know, about Jews. Uh, from an inside perspective. So, uh, absolutely, I, I encourage everyone. And so you mentioned a lot like about the importance of being Jewish and you, you found great solace in that book and inspiration. So how has being Jewish shaped your own worldview currently? Wow. I, I know it's, it's a heady question, but- Yeah, no, I think- I mean, listen, a little summary of that. Definitely. So I think- you know, definitely. I mean, there's a lot there, right? So, you know, I have recently gone into Jewish wisdom. Um, and so there's just a lot of things. I mean, you know, I, I totally believe that the world is a better place with Judaism. In it. And so that's basically my North Star. And then how do we reverse engineer that to ensure that Judaism is which is not just, you know, it's mainly the Jewish people, I would say. Judaism without peoplehood is basically non-existent. Um, I mean, that's my opinion. Maybe some others might disagree with that. But so I guess the question is, the Jewish people, for sure, I mean, this is factual. It's very hard to argue this. Um, make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. And not just for other Jews, but for the entire world. Right. And especially now with technology and economies of scale and globalization, um, it's now more pronounced than ever. Um, but even before sort of this new age of technology, we know that Jews have made uh, disproportionate contributions to all fields, whether it's literature, medicine, engineering, you know, you name it. Um, and even the so, legal system too. Exactly. Yeah. So, 
so I think that, you know, for me, it's like, okay, the world is a better place with Judaism and the Jewish people in it. Therefore, we have to work toward ensuring uh, what they call Jewish continuity. And we have to work toward ensuring that the Jewish people are not just surviving, but are thriving. And I know that sounds cliche, but that's really how I look at it. So my goal with Future of Jewish, with Izzy, and sort of the other products that we're working on that we'll be launching in the next coming months and years is how do we do two things at the same time? And I believe you can do them simultaneously in sort of a kill two birds with one stone way, which is how do we reinvigorate the Jewish people across the world to develop a true, genuine, organic Jewish pride, uh, not one that's forced or being told how to be Jewish, but one that comes from within, from the individual. Uh, and then those individuals can level up to communities and those communities can level up, level up to their cities and their countries. And then we can ultimately all level up to the Jewish people across the world. So that's part A. And part B is how do we get the rest of the world to, for, you know, in marketing, we talk about sort of a four stage process. So we talk about awareness, mm -hmm. interest, excitement, and conversion. Yeah. And so how do we take as many people across the world, non-Jewish people, um, and take them through that sort of psychological process to make them aware, not just what the Judaism exists, but what, what the hell is this thing called Judaism anyway? Um, that's a huge phase, right? That's like, because there's like, I boil it down to like eight different things. It's like religion and spirituality and history and philosophy and culture and life, etc. So like, just the awareness of like what all those things are within Judaism is a huge thing. Then, you know, not everyone will be interested in all eight of those things, but you pick maybe two, three, four that you're interested in. You go deeper into them. Now we're in the interest stage. And then we go to the excitement stage, right? And that's really deepening and also widening your sort of view and lens of Judaism. And then finally conversion, which in this case is not converting to Judaism. I want to be clear about that. Uh, that's just the word we use in marketing. It's basically getting everyone around the world to understand how special and unique and beneficial Judaism and the Jewish people are and getting to a place where, you know, we can, I, I guess, Buddhism, there's two cultures that I look at that I think are quite interesting parallels to, to Judaism. One is Buddhism and one is the African-American culture. And I think you know, when you look at, let's just say Buddhism, for example, you know, I think by and large today that when you, when you say Buddhism or Buddhist or yoga or mindfulness or meditation, like there's all very positive uh, connotations of those Absolutely. things. Mm -hmm. And so um, African-American culture, which is sports and music and fashion, again, by and large, you know, for people that actually understand African-American culture and are not racist or bigots or whatever, by and large, uh, positive connotations. So getting, you know, Judaism, Jewish peoplehood, uh, Jewish life, etc., to be a positive connotation for people around the world, specifically non-Jews in this case. And I believe that you can attack both that part A, which is that Jewish pride within Jews, and then that part B, which is um, getting the world to understand that Judaism is one of the world's bright spots. I think you can actually attack that simultaneously with more or less the same product services and experiences. And so that's how I look at the world and, and the work that, that I do every day. No, that's so true. What you said, especially we can have an entire podcast about the importance of having Jewish pride. It reminds me of a conversation I had during a meeting about a year ago with Russell Robinson. Um, for those who don't know, he's the executive director of the Jewish National Fund. And of course, you know, we we're talking and I'm very part of JNF. So, you know, we we're talking about into internal um, you know, topics. And then, what, and then I remember he had shared a story of how he grew up, that he grew up in Texas, a very secular Jew. And to him being Jewish was seen in his, you know, in his opinion as being very negative, right? Because all he heard was about and saw was anti-Semitism. And he had said to me, you know, why would someone want to play a bad card, right? So being Jewish, you know, at the time in the sixties was a very bad card, right? there were signs like no, no Jews, no Mexicans, um, you know, no, no dogs or like no, no blacks, no Jews, uh, couldn't enter, you know, swimming pools, couldn't enter certain areas of a community. 
Uh, in America, for those who don't know, uh, Jews could not live in certain parts of the country. There were quotas in universities. And so he also emphasized the fact that Jews who spend too much time being negative about all the hate that we get, it's not helping, you know, in, in terms of pro uh, propping up our cause and our cause is being prideful of being Jewish. You know, having, having it, we have this very rich history, right? That spans nearly 5,000 years. And yes, you know, like we're, we're persecuted, you know, we're, we're targeted, but that, that, that's not who, that, that, that's not everything who we are. That does not encompass being Jewish, right? So, you know, I walk around and I understand like, I, I'm not religious. I, I don't have any uh, clothing markers on me when, when I leave my apartment, but, you know, I do see many Orthodox Jews walking around. They're not all being pelted by rocks. You know, I've been to Israel six times. You live in Israel. It's, you know, it's not that Israel's actually being like wiped off the map, but yeah, we know that Iran wants to and, and other, you know, evil, um, you know, uh, players, of, um, actors as well would love to see that happen. But in reality, we have a strong nation. We have a strong homeland. We have a very strong people. And so there, there really needs to be that, that shift, like you said, in our, in our peoplehood's perspective, right? And are we focusing too much on anti-Semitism as a people? That's something I would love to discuss with you. The answer is yes. I believe, in my view, we are focusing on too much. Yeah. And, you know, I, I understand that that's a blanket statement. There are people that have experienced horrific anti-Semitic acts against them or against people in their family, uh, certainly the Holocaust uh, and, and other examples in recent history. But, you know, anti-Semitism can be also very intense for, you know, the Holocaust is a very extreme example, but also for somebody who vandalizes your local synagogue or who spits at you on the street or who, you know, those things are traumatic. Um, and I'm not downplaying any of those uh, experiences or the trauma that comes with that. So I want to be clear about that. Um, I personally have experienced anti-Semitism. Uh, I'm not going to tell that story because it's not that interesting, but I've experienced it. It's very uncomfortable. Um, and I sympathize with anyone who, no matter at what level, because it's purely uncomfortable and unacceptable. Let's be, let's call it what it is. Uh, now to, to, your, to your point slash question, which you know, are we focusing too much? The answer is yes. And, and the answer is yes, because um, you know, at a certain point, like, <laughs> it's funny, I, I always go back to this, this sentence that I learned from one of my Israeli girlfriends, her name is Raut. And she told me one time we weren't, this was, has nothing to do with anti-Semitism, but we were talking about something else. And she said, Josh, you don't attract bees with vinegar. You attract them with honey. And I think that's the sort of where, where I go um, when I see an overemphasis, in my view at least, on anti-Semitism and on anti-Israel, on BDS. Uh, again, those things are very real and serious, and we should absolutely deploy resources and people in time to combating those things. The question is, what's the proportion, right? And, and I do find that it is a bit disproportionate at times. And I do find ultimately that if we want to go back to what I believe is, 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 is the work that needs to be done, which is part A, organic, genuine, natural Jewish pride from within each Jewish person around the world, and part B, getting the world to realize that Judaism is one of the world's bright spots, if we want to accomplish that, then I ultimately think we need to attract both groups, the Jews and the non-Jews, with honey and not with vinegar. And I believe anti-Semitism and anti-Israelism and anti-Zionism and BDS, while important and, and absolutely necessary to talk about them at times, uh, ultimately, I think is the, is the vinegar that, you know, listen, most people have enough vinegar in their life, right? Whether they're Jewish or not Jewish, right? They have their own problems, their own challenges, their own hurdles. And so... I, you know, I, I find, especially now more and more with this 24 hour news cycle and social media and, you know, all the variations of those things, I find that very few people wake up every day and say, I wish I had more vinegar in my life, <laughs> you know? So I, on the other hand, I think most people wake up and say, I wish I had more honey in my life. 
And so I think the Jewish people have to do a much better job in the Jewish organizations and you know in the in the private sector, the for profit sector, which my companies are in. Um, you know, we have to do a much better job of bringing that honey to Jews and non-Jews. And that's what attracted me to Future of Jewish is that every single post that I read, it, it's so positive, right? And it's really connecting me to learning about the Jewish history and Jewish principles, Jewish philosophy, right? You know, like most people who are not rabbis or are not, you know, actively in that learning mode do not really you know, pick up a book and learn about Jewish philosophy and learn just like you said, like how much we as a people have contributed to humanity at large. So something you're, it's interesting what you had said about anti-Semitism also. So for me, I've never been physically attacked for being Jewish, but I remember uh, being in college uh, my freshman year and uh, one of my hallmates asked me, oh, did Jews used to have horns? right? And why did Jews kill Jesus? So I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. And I took it as a learning opportunity. I sat in her bed and I told her that, you know, all the reasons why we did not have horns, so that, that that's anti-Semitism. She didn't even know that word existed. And I told her how Jews did not kill Jesus. And in the course of our two-hour conversation, I had attracted half of the hall. So I was the only Jewish person on my, on my hall. And here were, I had this audience of non-Jews who themselves were learning, you know, the facts. Um, but something else I wanted to point out, and I don't know if, if others agree with this, but when I was growing up, all I heard about was, you know, in school about ancient Israel, and then we learned about the Holocaust. So those were the only two proponents I heard and learned about being Jewish, right? And so how many people today will say like, oh, I'm Jewish because of the Holocaust? which is, you know, it, it's, it's not, I'm not saying that their opinions are not correct, but, you know, how can we dwindle down 5,000 years of our people's history to a horrific genocide that spans six years, right? So through learning, you know, through doing, you know, research, uh, you know, for my own initiative, uh, taking back the narrative, like you said, uh, keeping positive, right? You know, I, I also could have spent, you know, half the website talking about the, the terrorist attacks and, and, and you know, the, the negatives from, from the non-Jewish groups, from most non-Jewish groups in, within Israel. But, but why? There's so much of that content online. And there, there's a section on, on my website uh, called Diversity in Israel, uh, Minorities in Israel. And why not focus on the positives, right? So Israel, it's, yes, it's a Jewish homeland, but many non-Jews live there, a couple million of them. And all groups do contribute positively, right? And also just researching the vast Jewish history. And, and yes, like, you know, of course, the, there was the Inquisition, the Holocaust, but we know about those. But what about, you know, the, the, uh, the brave uh, Jewish uh, military heroes? And, and what about all the principles, like you said, that we had, you know, released into the world? And, and what about, uh, the concept of justice, right? You know, America's founding fathers looked to, you know, our ancestors for, for inspiration. So there's just so much to be learned and to be appreciated about who we are. And I think that, and, and like you said, right? Like it's not to turn a blind eye, of course, right? Like we, we as Jews, I think should be aware of anti-Semitism, be an alert about it. Um, I just had a podcast with someone who, very much, you know, promotes Krav Maga, you know, for Jews to be an alert, for Jews to be, you know, physically fit and, and know how to handle, you know, handguns in any situation. So of, of course, right, like we, we can't just sit back and let others protect ourselves. However, it's like you mentioned about BDS, right? So to me, and you can feel free to disagree, but to me, BDS was basically an anti-Semitic hissy fit, right? And so the more attention that we poured, we as a Jewish community poured onto them, the bigger that they expanded. But in reality, as you know, you're in Israel, you, you have major, you know, stars still coming to Israel, uh, you know, uh, Israeli tech unicorns are multiplying, right? So in reality, BDS has not harmed Israel, right? I mean, it's trying to harm Jews more in America by um, you know, by signaling out Jewish businesses and targeting them. So that, that's a different focus, right? Like that, that we can say BDS is anti-Semitic, 
but it has done, in my opinion, um, again, you live in Israel, so you can tell me, but in my opinion, it has done nothing to Israel. And in fact, uh, having just been there, I think it actually helped Israel, right? Because a lot of non-Jews who were disgusted by BDS made it their mission to visit Israel, right? To counter the BDS movement. Um, and, and yes, I know that Israel lost Ben and Jerry's, which in my opinion is one of the worst ice creams anyway. So I, I don't, I, I think Israel won in, in that, in that situation, uh, no matter what, but, but yeah, so it, it's, it, it's like you said, with being negative, right? So if I was learning about a culture of people that was always emphasizing how they're being attacked and how being they're hated. I don't think I also would view that community that positively, right? I would think, why, why are they being hated? Not, you know, oh no, like I feel so bad for them. Exactly. So that, that's something that you're right, like we need to work on. Like we, we all need to have Jewish pride and, and no matter the religious, uh, you know, the religious uh, levels that we have or even, you know, and I know like a lot of Jews have different opinions on, on Israel, unfortunately, uh, I'm trying to combat that with history, you know, proving history, but it, it's just knowing our rich, rich history. And so I, I think that at some point there needs to be some kind of organization or, or some kind of initiative that, I don't know, just focuses on just Jewish pride, right? <laughs> to counter all of, of, all of that negativity that we, you know, just basically process, unfortunately. So speaking of Israel, um, I wanted to know, so we hear and read reports that unfortunately are mostly negative about how American Jews view Israel. So someone who, as someone who lives there, what is the reality that you see? And do you agree? Do you disagree? Um, so, you know, one time I was talking to a, found, a Jewish foundation, a CEO of the foundation, or executive director, and, you know, I was telling him about all the issues that I see in the Jewish nonprofit world. And he said, listen, I, I agree with you, but they're not just unique to the Jewish nonprofit world. The problems that you're talking about are seen in the nonprofit world in general. And so I would say the same thing when you, you talk about Jewish Americans and sort of their, their views on Israel. Well, let's just talk about Americans in general. And by the way, I'm an American, so I'm also speaking about my former self. Mm -hmm. Americans don't know that much about the world. So forget what American Jews think about Israel. Mm -hmm. That's, a, you know, that's a byproduct of the fact that Americans, maybe today it's changing with, you know, internet and social media and globalization, but by and large, a lot of Americans think that America is the entire world and that the entire world must think and do like America. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we hear, I mean, I remember growing up with George W. Bush and American exceptionalism, and he wasn't the first president to talk about that, of course. But, you know, I think maybe you can point to World War One, World War Two, where America sort of becomes the indisputable world power. Maybe back then it starts to become um, a thing where, like, America is the center of the world in the eyes of Americans. So I would say, you know, that's that's the issue there. Um, you know, frankly, the reason I started Izzy is to give the world mm -hmm. the good, the bad, and the ugly of Israel, the full 360 degree view of the country that I've been living in since 2013. Mm -hmm. And my general bet is that if, if people see the full picture of Israel, mm -hmm. uh, which normally they don't get to see in the news and in day-to-day -day conversations with people saying things good or bad about Israel, if you see the 360 degree view, the 100% of the pie, my feeling is the breakdown is more or less 60 to 70% good, 20% mm -hmm. bad, 10% ugly. And I would say when you compare that to other countries, including the country that you're sitting in right now, uh, the United States, I would say that's a pretty good ratio, you know. Absolutely. And, and you're 70, right. 70, 20, 10. And it's that 10%, unfortunately, that is really loud, right? So that they're, they're the most... I would say, you know, uh, misinformed uh, on Israel and they spread the most lies, right? So, so you have that extreme. Um, and yeah. I don't mean extreme because, you know, there's the truth and there's the non truth. So you have, um, you know, even from the pro Israel side, you know, you have Jews who are only looking at Israel through just pure rose tinted glasses, right? Don't see anything negative about Israel. And that, that, that can be true, right? Every country has some negative aspects about it, right? Whether it's history, 
uh, whether it's current practices, um, and, and I think what is considered anti-Semitism, and feel free to, to jump in if you disagree here, it's that Israel should be treated like a country, right? Not as an exception, right? So we can't expect Israel to just be perfect when no other country is expected to be perfect either. And so I, I think that also would help, you know, in being, in more people being more pro-Israel, right? It's just understanding that, you know, like Israel had, you know, for example, like, you know, what happened with, with the Yemenite Jews um, wasn't its, its best moment. Uh, you know, racism towards Mizrahim, you know, for decades also, you know, like not something to laud about, but that's part of Israel's history. And at the very least, like Israel has acknowledged, you know, its mistakes, whereas many countries don't acknowledge, right? Like far, far worse. So it's, I, I think it behooves, you know, like both sides to mend together, right? Like for the extreme negative to learn some, you know, actual truth and, and those who, you know, view Israel as just being this perfect place to also acknowledge that, you know, it's a real country and, you know, mistakes have happened also in the past as well. Definitely. And, you know, I mean, I, I think that our, the argument that you're making is, 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 is a good, well, I should say it's a good argument. It's, it's, the, it's the right argument, meaning it has merit in that Israel should just, there shouldn't be a double standard between how we view Israel and other countries around the world. But I don't think that that argument is strategic anymore. Um, maybe it never was. I don't know. But I think that that's not a, an effective way. Of, it's it's you know, in business, one of the if you ask me like what are the top three things I've learned running my own company, startups now for the last two or three years, one of the things is it's better to be smart than right. And so you're right. The people that make that argument that you know don't hold Israel to a double standard, you're right. Anyone who thinks that that's that's totally true, but that's not the smart argument to make, in my opinion, at least not anymore. Maybe it was once upon a time. I think the smarter argument to make is to invite people to learn more about, uh, first of all, Jewish history. You know, I wrote a really fun essay. One of the first essays that I wrote for Future of Jewish is called A Brief History of the Jewish People, where I literally, you know, you can't put in everything, but I, I, you know, it's a 30 to 40 minute essay in terms of reading time. And, you know, I really go back to literally from Abraham and Sarah all the way to present day Israel. And of course the diaspora and, you know, American Jewish community being not just the second biggest population of Jews in the world, but uh, maybe even the most powerful population of Jews, including more powerful than Israel, you could argue. So, you know, I think starting with Jewish history is a really good place to start. Then obviously you, you get to Israel and then you get to Israeli history. And so I would start there and I would say, you know, let's just look at what's happened mm -hmm. and let's look at the full picture. Um, you know, Israel has done some things that I think we would all agree are not necessarily um, kosher, if you will. But I think people also have to realize something. And, and this is not something that you'll ever get in a history book, um, you know, American Jews and French Jews and Australian Jews, um, especially ones that were born like in the last one or two generations, I mean, uh, they were born into a country that was already built. Exactly. Okay. And like Israel, you know, founded in 1948, there was some building before that, of course, but I mean, you just don't have the wherewithal to think about sort of these bigger picture issues, if you will, in terms of how do you deal with um, refugees? How do you deal with the Palestinian conflict? How do you deal with, you know, Hamas or Hezbollah? Um, you have to understand something. I mean, Maslow's hierarchy of needs applies to everyone in the world. And so when you're building, literally building a country and also having to work, right? And also having to take care of your kids and also dealing with wars every few years, with like, no financial help from the UN and nothing like that. Yeah, I mean, I'm talking more at the, in the individual level, right? So not, not at the state level. Um, so you have to understand, like, Israelis are great people by and large. I mean, I, I think they're really extraordinary people. And they've become that because of, of the Israeli history of, of the state of Israel. Um, but, like, they're, they're also just people like you and I. And, like, you know, they, they didn't, I mean, I would say maybe this has changed with the most recent generation in Israel and, and, but 
you know, like my parents' generation of those Israelis, like they just didn't have the 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 mental space and the emotional energy to think about some of the issues that now we talk mm-hmm. at length about today. And so I think just you know that's not something that you'll ever get in a history book, but I I just caution people, you know, two things. One, come to Israel and talk to everyday Israelis and ask them hard questions. And Israelis are not afraid, unlike Americans, and I know that's a generalization, but Israelis are not afraid to talk about politics. And Israelis will answer your hard questions. And Israelis will uh, even argue with you and even shout at you, but they'll never hate you. They'll never say, I don't want to be friends with you anymore. or I don't consider you a family member anymore. Uh, Israelis, I think, by and large, have done a very good job of building, building a society in which you can talk about very hard and uncomfortable things and not end in, you know, the loss of a friendship or the excommunication of a family member, so to speak. So I would say that. And then the other thing I would say is, especially to Jews around the world, and especially to to not just Jews around the world, but also in, in Israel included, is you know, it's very easy to be critical of your own self. In fact, there's psychology that, uh, research that has, has shown that people are always more critical of, of their own uh, their own sort of social groups because they relate to them and they know them better than, for example, a social group or a country or whatever that they don't really have any relationship with. And so it's, it's actually a psychological tendency to be more critical of, of those that you can relate to but you also have to be smart, right? And like be critical and 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 try to improve the situation. That's a very Jewish thing. We, we know that, you know, the great Israeli statesman Shimon Peres has a great quote that says, the Jew's greatest gift to the world is our lack of satisfaction. We always believe things can be made better. Yeah. And so I'm all about improvement. You want to call it tikkun olam, you want to call it something else. I'm all about that. It's not just I'm about that. That's a Jewish thing. That's part of our DNA going back thousands of years. So that's fine. But at the same time, don't, don't forget that our worst enemies did not care if you were the right Jew and they were the wrong ones. If you were the religious and they were the secular. If you lived in Israel and they lived in America. A Jew is a Jew is a Jew. Exactly. And as long as you're dead, that's all we want. That's what our own worst enemies Thought. They didn't differentiate the way that we Jews differentiate between the secular and the religious and the reform and the reconstructionist and the orthodox and the Israeli and the American. So right, the Zionist, you know, non-Zionist, right? To them, to them, it's all it's all a Jew. You're exactly. absolutely right. And I'm I, not saying, by the way, that the Holocaust will happen again. It's not what I'm saying. It's not the point. No. The point is, if you read a in history book, I just believe myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I'm not talking about a history book that was written to describe the history of the last hundred years. I'm talking about go read history books that were written going back three, 4,000 years and certainly four, five, 600, 800 years. And you'll understand that, you know, the Holocaust was not a, a coincidence or an isolated incident, right? It was just another one of the several instances in Jewish history where Jews have been horribly persecuted and and so will, will another Holocaust happen? No, I don't, no. I would be quite surprised. Will another persecution of the Jews in a relatively vicious and certainly unacceptable uh, manner happen? Well, I mean, history is often our greatest guide. And so if I just look at history, then I would say, unless we're smarter as Jews, and of course, having a strong Jewish state in Israel is very important, then yeah, I would say it, it will happen again. Will it happen in our lifetime? I don't know. Will it happen 500 years from now? Maybe. You know, no one knows what's going to happen in the future and when it will happen. But just, I just caution people: just, just be careful. You know, be critical and be Jewish in that way. But, but also be careful because um, it, it's not worth it. And, and in my opinion, it's being what I call a bad Jewish ancestor. Because, like I said, the 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 you know the next great persecution, knock on wood, it never happens. But the next great persecution of the Jews, it will not affect us in all likelihood. But it could affect your Jewish grandchildren, or your Jewish great grandchildren, or your Jewish great 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 great. And so, I have come to learn just in the last few months that we have a duty as Jews to be great Jewish ancestors. We think about ancestors in the past. No, 
you and I are going to also be ancestors once upon a time. And so today, exactly. when we're dead, we have no, no choice in the matter. But while we're living, Bezrat Hashem, we have to think beyond ourselves and beyond our own lives and our own families and our own communities. And we have to think, what will Jews look like and feel like and act like and want in the future, one, 10, 100,000 generations from now? And I think that's a very hard thing to do, to sort of think outside of yourself in the near and far future, beyond your lifetime. But don't forget that, again, if you go just through Jewish history, uh, so many Jews that have come before us have made incredible sacrifices and died for us mm -hmm. so that me and you can be having this great conversation today and that people in America can be living uh, relatively great lives as Jews and the same in other places in the world. The fact that we have a strong state of Israel, which again, wasn't the case before 1948. So like, you know, we have to, we have to be very careful in towing that line between being critical and constructive critically about you know how we can improve things, but also being a good Jewish ancestor and remembering where we've come and who and what have uh, has been done before us and, and potentially what could happen after us. No, absolutely, I agree with you because um, you know we have to focus on on the strength, right? And and the, like you said, like the, the future, the continuity, right? Like Judaism, our our people have survived based on continuity, right? There could have been that break. There could have been that mass conversion, right? They, they attempted to convert us in the Inquisition, and it didn't happen. And we could actually have an entire segment, an entire episode, unfortunately, on Jewish self-hate, or as some people say, you know, extreme criticism. And someone non-Jewish told me, he said, I don't understand your people, right? So he was smart enough to say, like, your people, not your religion. He said, I don't understand your people. He said, you know, like, I'm, I'm Belgian, right? He's like, I am not marching in the street against Belgium, right? I also have German ancestry. And, and as horrific as they were in history, I'm not anti-Germany, right? And he said something that was powerful. He said, only Jews and Indian people, because he has a lot of Indian friends from India, are the only two people in the world who have problems with self-hate. No one else does. So that's something you're right. Like we really need to, um, you know, instill, you know, in our families, in our communities, and understand that that's the only way forward about that. So you mentioned a lot about Jewish peoplehood, and I really appreciate that because, to me, one of the propagates of anti-Semitism or anti-Israel, you know, uh, attitudes uh, from American Jews that we were talking about is that, oh, I'm not religious. The religious people live in Israel, therefore Israel has nothing to do with me, right? And I, I know so many people in my own personal life who had said that. He's like, oh, like, you know, Israel's over there. I'm not religion. I'm not religious. What does Israel have to do with me? So how do we bridge that gap, which, you know, I'm trying to do with my initiative. I know you're, you're doing with your initiative as well, is that we are people. And I, like, personally, I didn't even know that. You know, and well, first of all, I didn't know I was Jewish until I was 78 years old. So when I found out, I just learned that, okay, you know, my, my people spoke Yiddish because I didn't know anything. I didn't know Mizrahi Jews existed until 15 years ago, basically. I grew up with a lot of Ashkenaz Jews. And so I literally thought that Jews are from Europe, right? Yiddish, the Holocaust, pogroms, my, my own family. Only recently did I do a DNA test and find out that I'm actually 8% Sephardic, which was really cool to find out. And so when people used to ask me growing up, what's your background? I would say Russian, right? I wouldn't say Jewish. I would say Russian. And now being so entrenched in, in Zionism education, I, I just, I detest that I ever said that, right? Because my, my homeland is not Russia, right? Like I have nothing to do with the Slavic people. Uh, the Slavic people rejected my family, right? Like my, my, my parents would say they had a passport and it didn't say Russian on it. The passport said J for Jew, right? And they didn't have M for Muslim. It was just for Jews. So what now when people ask me my background, I say I'm Jewish, right? Like I'm a Jew. And so how do you see 
the the shift right to us embracing ourselves as a people that have a unique religion right like we have a religion but we are not a religion right and so something that we talked a little bit off record is that I also think sometimes and I'm not against converts at all you know I think if someone wants to convert to Judaism more than welcome but does also you know converts complicate things too right because when they convert they say that they're that they're jewish right and so technically you know yes they're jewish but you know genetically they're they're not a jew right so i really appreciate like someone like ivanka trump for example who understands the difference right so she says you know like i'm jewish like i I practice judaism but she knows that she's not a jew right like her genetics are still her genetics so something, you know, kind of to discuss, like, so how do we hone into ourselves that we are a people, right? How, how do we do that, that, that binds, binds us together? Yeah, so I don't necessarily agree with the whole conversion thing for, for the answer to your question, which is, you know, I don't like to play the game about who's Jewish and who's not. Um, there's just too many, too much time has passed and you can't, you know, you, n- none of us really know, you know, if you go back four or 500 years, one, 2000 years, like maybe we, some, you know, our ancestors converted. So I don't like to play that game. I also don't like to play that game in Israel about, you know, Jewish mother, Jewish father. Um, I understand where it comes from and I understand why other people are interested in that game. I personally am not. Um, listen, I think being a Jew um, is about culture and wisdom. Um, those to me are, are the two most important and pertinent pillars of Judaism. There are other pillars, religion, spirituality. Um, but for me, Jewish culture, which by the way, there is no single Jewish culture. I mean, that's the other kind of interesting thing. You know, I wrote an article about this and in there, I talked about how at the Museum of the Jewish People, which is the number one basically Jewish people who museum in the world here in Tel Aviv. Anu, um, right. Yeah, Anu. Uh, in Hebrew, it's Beta Tzotzot. Um, you know, even they have something on the wall when they're talking about Jewish culture that basically they say, so there is no one Jewish culture. We don't even know how to really describe it. That's basically what it says on the wall. Uh, they, they put it a little bit ni- more nicely, but that's the, the crux of it. And so, um, I think that's also the beauty of it is that, um, you know, especially now with Israel, Israeli culture coming into its own. And of course, you have, you know, historically European Jewish culture and you have, you know, Middle Eastern Jewish culture, the Mizrahim, as you talked about. And you have Jewish cultures that have now developed in different parts of the world in Australia, South Africa, uh, South America. American Jewish culture obviously has been a thing for a while now. So, I think that's a really cool thing because we all can sort of learn from each other's culture. I mean, the American Jews can learn from the Israeli Jews and the Israeli Jews can learn from, for example, the Australian Jews and the Australian Jews can learn from the South American Jews. And I think that, first of all, there are a lot of similarities just in terms of the fact that, you know, our history as a people is rooted, not in every case, but in a lot of cases within our cultures. So there are overlaps. They're not totally diametrically opposed things. Um, but there are a lot of things that are also quite unique to each of these sort of subcultures within the umbrella Jewish culture, if you will. And so I think that that actually is what makes it interesting. And that's a really fun way to sort of share similarities and differences and borrow things from, from the other that, um, you know, that we can do in that process. Um, wisdom, you know, I think it's, it's not really something that, you know, wisdom is something that usually doesn't change or, or if it does change, it's incredibly slowly. So you know, I think Jewish wisdom is just so powerful. Like I said earlier, I'm really getting into that aspect of Judaism a lot more now. And it's never ending. I mean, it's lifelong learning. And even then, you probably can't wrap your full head around it. Um, but I would say, like, that's a really two good places to start for how we can reinvigorate Jewish peoplehood on a global scale. Um, how we can create more productive conversations among Jews, especially of dissimilar Jews whether it's geographically dissimilar, religiously, spiritually, politically, socioeconomically, whatever. And I think that by having more productive conversations, which 
are interpersonal, but they're also what I would call global, meaning, um, you know, one of the goals that we're, we have with Izzy is, you know, we want to democratize access to Judaism and to Israel, of course, the, the capital of Judaism, to everyone around the world, so that everyone can get the same content, the same materials, the same quote unquote education. The issue that we have today is everything is very fragmented and siloed. And so what American Jews are learning is different than what Israeli Jews are learning. And even in Israel, by the way, what sort of Israeli Jews are learning, for example, in Tel Aviv is different than what they're learning in, in the Shtachim in, in, the, in the West Bank, so to speak. Um, Judea and Samaria, yeah. Judea and Samaria, so yeah. Yeah, semantics in my opinion, but never mind. Um, you know, uh, the, the, the point is that I believe that when we all have access to the same materials and the same content, then we can, you know, that's the global, and then we can synthesize it down to the individual or the communal. And we can now start having conversations about the same things. Now, people will disagree. I mean, that's, we know Judaism is all about disagreement. Go, go into a yeshiva. Why do you think it's so loud? Because exactly. uh, they're, they're debating and, and often disagreeing with each other about the interpretation of, of text. But um, I also believe that within that debate and, and, and discussion and disagreement, we will find a lot of similarity and coming togetherness and compromise and wow, you know, I never really thought about it like that. Or, you know, why do you, why do you think, or why do you, why do you perceive, you know, this piece of Jewish wisdom that way, or this piece of Jewish history that way? And then we have those conversations. And an Israeli Jew who lived through six wars will tell you, listen, I've lived through six wars. Like, what do you want from me? And the American Jew will say, oh, wow, I've actually never even lived through one war. I mean, I'm talking about a war on, on the homeland, not, you know, in Iraq and Afghanistan or Vietnam. And, and then all of a sudden, you know, you start to create empathy and you start to create compassion and you start learning and you start realizing there's not one truth, but there's thousands of truths, there's not one history, there's thousands of histories. And so, uh, you know, for me, I, I would love to see way more productive conversations and new conversations. You know, Brent Stevens, who is the editor in chief of Sapir magazine, formerly, I believe, of the New York Times. He might still be at the New York Times, I'm not sure. New York Times, Wall Street um, Journal, yeah. So, you know, he says, we've been having the same stale conversation for far too long, and I completely agree. Chalas, mm -hmm. and that's an Arabic word, by the way, like enough, you know, it's, right. it's, it's, it's just boring. And I think it's not, it's not attracting very few people, it's really detracting them. And they're basically, I, again, I go back, no one wakes up in the morning and says, I want more boring conversation. Yeah. Just like they don't wake up and say, I want more vinegar. Exactly. They wake up and they say, I want to be inspired, motivated, intrigued, interested, impassioned. And we're just not doing a good enough job of that. And I think once we can start doing a better job of that, then Jewish peoplehood will really come to the fruition that I think so many of us want. No, it's true. But I do want to add, though, and I'm not disagreeing with you about the converts. I'm just, I guess, adding because I just learned about this recently, uh, doing my own research on, on our people. It's that in actuality, there were not that many converts uh, just because, you know, Jews were insular and overall, you know, how did conversions happen in the past uh, for other religions, right? They were mostly through military absorption and Jews were not absorbed into militaries and we were siphoned off into ghettos, right? Very, uh, when was like 15th century in, uh, in Italy? So they, I mean, like, you know, we had uh, patterns, like, it, this is interesting, I just learned this, that between the first and second exile, when Jews went uh, west into North Africa, they actually had pretty violent campaigns in some parts to convert locals. That, to me, was fascinating, right? We don't learn about that. So in a way, it was also kind of a proud moment, because I just had a podcast about the fact that we're tough. Jews, right? And everyone looks at us like, like we're weak, right? And so like, oh, okay, like, even militarily, you know, maybe it wasn't ideal what some Jews did, but, you know, we did have moments of, of military prowess, so to say. But overall, you know, Jews were very insular. And so, yeah, it, it's actually like a misconception that we just had this onslaught of converts in, into, into our communities. Um, but again, like, you know, we should absolutely welcome, you know, those who do seek to convert, you know, to our peoplehood um, as well. But I, I think there's something to be said about just being proud of our, our genetics. Like I'll, I'll share a little story that 
um, you know, I got, I've been to Israel about four times at this point. And, you know, of course I was moved and I felt it was my homeland. And then on my fifth trip, I went to Judea and Samaria and I stood on those hills and I cannot describe the feeling I got. It was just this feeling of this Judean warrior blood, like rushing through me, right? It's like, I'm standing on the hills where my people were shepherds and, and um, you know, they, they fought against the Greeks, they fought against the Romans. It's just this powerful uh, feeling that it would really help, you know, a lot of other Jews to have, like to have that, that connection, right? You know, I, I didn't get that feeling when I was in Europe. I didn't get that feeling when I was in Japan. I didn't get that feeling when I was in, in South America. So it's, 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 it's pretty powerful. So kind of to wrap up, um, where do you see Israel in, in the future, in 20 years, in 50 years? And also since starting Future of Jewish, what have you been surprised by that you were maybe not aware of before? Um, to answer your first question, where do I see Israel? Um, I think Israel will continue to be a leader in various fields, agriculture, medicine, different types of technologies, new technologies, emerging technologies, uh, academia, and so on and so forth. Um, I, I don't see that changing. Um, you know, I think that we hopefully will, will be able to stabilize the Middle East with some of these new partnerships. I mean, Saudi Arabia now is in the mix, which is a huge, huge yeah. step in, in what I believe is the right direction. Um, with that said, it's not, you know, these, these peace deals with, you know, all of the Arab countries, eh, there's geopolitical issues there that people should look into. It's not all rainbows and butterflies, but nonetheless, I think it's a, it's a nice step in, in, in a sort of a right direction by and large. Um, so th that's where I see Israel. Um, your second question, what, what have I been most surprised by since starting Future of Jewish? Or have you been surprised by anything? Like, like did anything, you know, or, did, or were any of your perspectives changed uh, in, in that process of starting the initiative? Yeah, I mean, I think just on a personal level, I mean, some of my theories on a business level have basically not been unchanged since I really started thinking from sort of a business mindset about how we can get the Jewish people back on the right track in terms of combating a lot of these growing and worrisome trends. Um, on a personal level, yeah, I think for me, you know, like I said, Jewish wisdom is only something that I was for, frankly familiar with just in the last few months. I mean, where I look for it previously is self-help books and, you know, Simon Sinek and Gary Vaynerchuk and, you know, Steve Jobs and, and you know, Buddhism and, and, and things of that nature. So I think for me to really open the Pandora's box of Judaism has um, enlightened my, my Judaism, my personal Judaism. Um, I think that now more than ever, I am incredibly compassionate about the, the so-called other, and, and in this case, the so-called other Jew. Mm -hmm. um, I tremendously enjoy having conversations with Jews that don't look, act, and think like me. Um, and, and not just saying hi and bye, shalom, mm -hmm. but, 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 but really you know, having conversations about, not, not so much about you know, who's right and who's wrong, uh, just again, I, I love I love the question why? Why do you think that way? Why do you see it that way? Why do you do what you do? Why do you believe what you believe? And I'm fascinated by the diversity of answers. You know, we look at, for example, uh, a lot of non-Orthodox Jews, including myself, once upon a time, look at sort of the Orthodox community as this uh, I don't know, one one size fits all. You know, they're all the same. No, they're not all the same, and they're just as diverse as us in the non-Orthodox world. Even more diverse, um, I would counter. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, you know, I think that um, that's something that I'm trying to, in my own way, through Future of Jewish, uh, some of the writing that I do, I'm trying to, you know, inspire and, and hopefully motivate other Jews to engage with the other and to, you know, come with an open mind and, and come from a place of, you know, enlighten me 
tell me something I don't know, right? I mean, talk about Jewish, Jewish wisdom, and this is where I'll, I'll wrap up, is, you know, I believe in the Talmud, it says something like a wise person is somebody who learns from everyone. Mm -hmm. And so I, I find that, just, I can speak for myself, and I'm sure a lot of people can relate to this, that, you know, there were times in my, in my life where I came to a meeting, whether it was a business meeting or a, a conversation with a friend or what have you, and I wasn't there to learn. I was there to tell and to say and to explain and to justify. And I think that something that I am really trying to do now is both professionally and personally is come with that mindset, mindset of, you know, this meeting, this conversation, whatever it is, I want to learn something new and maybe learn a lot of new things, not just one or two things. So, you know, I think that um, for me, having these really cool conversations with much different people and then going into that that Jewish history and that Jewish wisdom which are you know basically concentric circles um, has been something that I definitely didn't expect um, I don't know if I'm surprised but I am very inspired and therefore continue to go deeper and wider into my personal Judaism and I'm sure to an extent that plays a role in my professional Judaism as well. Well, I know that you and your work uh, greatly inspire me. You know, my daily life is spent within, within history, right? I use history to, you know, counter anti-Semitism. I'm trying to fill in the blank between uh, biblical times and 1948, the liberation of Israel. And I, I get your writings and my mind is expanded each and every time. So um, if someone, or I, I encourage everyone uh, to, to get in touch, to sign up, um, what's the best way for people to sign up for Future of Jewish? Because your writings are truly inspirational. Thank you. So, so I have the book Future of Jewish, which you can find on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, the websites. Um, the publication that you're talking about with the essay is Future of Jewish, basically one word dot substack s-u-b-s-t-a-c-k dot com and then the jewish of future podcast uh, you can find on apple Podcasts, google Podcasts, spotify etc perfect and i'll include the links when this episode is posted and i know that i feel very enriched um instrumental monumentally as a jew every time i open up something from future of jewish so you're doing great work thank you so much and this is just going to expand, um, you know, in the future. So thank you for your time. Thank you for a great conversation. And I look forward to your next post. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Thank you. Good night.